Good morning, folks. Hi, welcome. My name is Matthew Skelton. I'm from Conflux. And I'd like to share with you today some uh, practical experience of uh, increasing operability within a continuous delivery context. So today's talk will look a bit like this. There'll be, it's like a, a sandwich. There'll be an experience report and then some practical stuff in the middle and then more experience report at the end. Unfortunately, I've not brought any biscuits with me today, so don't expect to get any cookies, but the talk will look a bit like that. By operability, I mean very simply making software work well in production. And operability involves lots of things like these. Diagnosing problems, clearing down data, reporting on stuff that's going well or going badly, monitoring things, securing things, inspecting the state of things, uh, making sure we can deal with failover, scaling things out, scaling things down, these kind of things. These are the kind of things that users don't quite rightly particularly care about until the application fails, until they can't use the application, then they care very, very much. And I've come to see, I've been, I've been working on operability for quite a number of years, and I have come to see operability actually in these terms. We're really optimizing for kind of long-term customer experience and the viability of the service instead of kind of short-term delivery of features. So when we're thinking about software services that are going to last for a long time or that we want to make sure are available to customers over an extended period, that's when we really have to be investing in the operability of our systems, not just pushing out the latest features that users can see. And effectively, it helps us to make um, the, the, the spend or revenue uh, associated with our software much more sustainable. It also makes things sustainable for the human beings so if you've got humans on call or working on a pager or they're, they're, they're on call for the, the systems overnight, their lives are more sustainable, if you like, because we've addressed these operational concerns much, more, uh, much sooner. And for the organization that we're, we're building these systems for, the outcomes are more uh, predictable. And predictability, more than pure speed, is often what, uh, what we actually need to be optimizing for in many of these situations. In a continuous delivery context is, is, is how I've been working for, the, for many years. What do we mean by that? Well, I take as my starting point this book here by Dave Farley and Jess Humble, Continuous Delivery, published in 2010, uh, and still utterly relevant today. Yes, they wrote the book prior to uh, large-scale containerization, but all of the techniques in here are still completely relevant to how we build software systems today. In fact, I challenge you to find a technique in the book that is not relevant uh, in your context. We need, for continuous delivery to work, we need good engineering practices. We need fast feedback from deployment pipelines. That's effectively what a deployment pipeline is for, yes, it's for deploying stuff, but it's to give us a kind of sensing mechanism for how well our software is actually working. It's like a pair, extra pair of eyes or a pair of insect antennas like this. It helps us to sense what's going on with uh, how, we're building, how we're building the software. We also need to realign our arch software architecture to enable us to do this rapidly. So things like microservices, that's not the only thing we can do, but that kind of approach. And we also need to make sure that we've, uh, we have a kind of team ownership of different bits of software. We don't have multiple people tr fighting trying to update the same stuff. We've got very clear ownership uh, boundaries um, within our organization or within the people who are building the systems. So we, lots of people know all this stuff. This is all fine. If it's new, then there's some useful things here for you to, to take away and consider. But th these aren't the main points of my talk today. Uh, I actually wrote a book a few years ago called Continuous Delivery with Windows and .NET. Even if you're not in a Windows and .NET world, though, this book's actually quite useful 
Um, it was picked up by the course leader at a university in London called UCL. And it's actually one of the, the key texts for the, the master's course in software engineering at that, at that university because the way in which we explain kind of continuous delivery concepts and things is, is very, is very uh, straightforward, very transparent, and it is not very related to .NET in some parts. So if you've got colleagues who you want to kind of bring on board to this way of thinking, then you can download a copy of this book. It's actually on O'Reilly Safari, O'Reilly Safari. So you can get, if you've got access to that, you've got access to the book. You can also um, buy a printed copy. If you go to the website that's on, that listed on there, cdwithwindows.net, you can buy a printed copy and we'll send you uh, one or more pr uh, printed copies of the book. Because it's really useful get, kind of getting your colleagues in different departments to understand things um, more quickly. Okay. So here's the, here's the first biscuit part of the, of the uh, biscuit sandwich. A little experience report. What I've been doing recently to, to, to put some of these techniques in context. So for most of 2018, uh, I was engin engineering lead at a large department in the UK government. There's a, just over 700 people, depending on how you counted it, in total. We had about 70 teams across several different locations. And because of some kind of event that's happening to the UK at the moment, which you may have heard of, we had some fairly time-critical delivery of software. Uh, so we're working in that kind of space. And it's kind of a complicated environment. We needed to increase the speed and safety of delivery, pure speed, no use in that kind of context where we're dealing with quite sensitive data and that affects people's lives. We have to make sure we're optimizing for both speed and safety at the same time. This was a multi-year program of work, some of which some of that work had been going for many, many years, many, many teams involved. Um, and it was important for us to track and control the infrastructure costs. The technology landscape was fairly, fairly standard stuff. It, they'd recently moved from traditional data centers, VMs and so on, to uh, more of a Kubernetes-based, um, container-based approach. Um, so uh, with alongside Complex, there was another company called Axiologic. There were loads of other organizations involved as well. Um, we, we worked in partnership on, on our particular area. And some of the things that we, that some of the dynamics that were in play at the time the, the number of people and the kind of size of the software systems that were being built were about seven times what they were just a few years before. So some of the dynamics are going to be different because the, the rules don't apply uh, at, uh, at nearly an order of magnitude larger. We had to spread awareness of effective software practices across you know, these many hundreds of people. And we were crossing some internal boundaries and some external boundaries. So internal boundaries across different departments, external boundaries to, to different suppliers outside, providing data, different countries, and different uh, private uh, organizations supplying, supplying data into the into systems. Lots of different viewpoints of what continuous delivery actually means. This is why I mentioned the book before, because that's always my starting point. But lots of people think it's just about pushing things out uh, many times a day, which might be one outcome of continuous delivery, but is not the, is not the aim, and so on. Um, how many people have work currently in organizations where there's a strong drive to have just one way of doing everything? Raise your hand if you're in that unfortunate position now. Oh, not so many. OK. Um, so we had to contend with that kind of, uh, that kind of way of thinking in some quarters. To, to move towards a situation where we could actually explore multiple different ways of doing things. It's important to define the platform. We heard in the keynote this morning uh, from Joe Bida about Kubernetes being a kind of platform for building platforms. And one crucial thing that we found, as in many places, is um, it can, some people may have very different views about what the platform is or whether they're actually exists a platform in that particular context. And so actually being very clear about what the platform is that you're building on and where that kind of boundary sits is incredibly important. So we did quite a bit of work around that. There's various other things like improving logging quality and making, it, making the delivery model work at different suppliers and so on. So I want to work through a few things that we did. So 
to help in this context. We moved from a, a, an operating model that was very siloed, lots of different kind of organizational groups, into something that was more optimized for a flow of change through to production. That's still ongoing. A really important thing um, that relates to operability then is the operator experience. What is it like for people in the ops team or the live services team or the system support team, whatever, whatever you call it for people who are on call or who are responsible for the live services, production services, what is their experience? Actually assess what their experience is. The great thing these days with agile techniques like um, you know, UX, user experience, is that we, we know how to do that. We don't have to invent it in, this, in, the, in the context of operability. We use existing standard UX techniques, which we'll see in a little bit, to assess the experience of people who are actually running, these, uh, running and supporting these systems. And it's amazing how much progress you can make by starting with the experience of the people who are currently having to run these systems or look after them and asking them, how nice is it or how awful is it for you to currently run to work with this software? If you can get those people on board, which is kind of what we did, it can be transformational in terms of the, the effect it has on, on, on enabling the software to run well. So we had lots of people on site. We, did, we also did uh, two really important things. I think uh, Tanya mentioned aspects of these in her keynote yesterday. Um, we ran two related but slightly, slightly different groups every week. Something called the Guild, which is a sharing of, of knowledge across uh, multiple teams, quite technical, um, but it could also be, it could, uh, people had gave talks that were related to stuff they were doing on the program, but also stuff that would be done doing outside. If someone was playing around with a Raspberry Pi, for example, or they built some kind of, uh, I don't know, whatever, they, they were tinkering around with something, that they, they built, a, built a racing car or something at home. They come and do a talk on that because we'd learn something about kind of engineering techniques from from um, from people's own kind of projects, um, and that was coupled with um, what we called the engineering working group, which was a group of interesting people who had a strong interest in things like operability, testability, things like this, come together and steer the focus across across all the teams. What do we need to improve across the board? Is logging working well? Exactly what's working well and what's not working well? Um, when should we introduce uh, a new metrics platform, for example, Prometheus? When's the right time to do it? What, who do we need to ask? Who do we need to get on board in order to do it? And so we ran uh, each of these groups every two weeks, so they kind of overlapped. So each week, so one week it was Engineering Guild, then it was Engineering Working Group, and back to Engineering Guild again. And that, that kind of cycle of um, talking about stuff and sharing knowledge, uh, but also coming together and really arg arguing, discussing what we need to focus on next was a really good driver, really good way of, of, of driving effective attention to detail for things like operability. We have some weekly lunchtime tech talks as well. Um, I spent some time doing, helping to explain continuous delivery to people who don't write code because it's quite important to make sure people are all in the same headspace. There's a set of slides online uh, which you can, you're welcome to download and use if you want. Uh, these, these slides that I'm presenting now will be online later, so you don't need to uh, read the eight-point font that's at the bottom of, that, bottom of that screen right now. But it's quite important to, to take non-techies through things like continuous delivery, operability, how we do testing in this kind of context, because it's very, very different for them, for, for many of these people. And we also introduced and, and helped to promote some team-first operability techniques, which I'm going to share with you now. Any questions about this, this, this first part? All make sense? So the first technique that we spent quite a bit of time embedding was um, a modern approach to logging. Uh, I actually did a talk on these uh, these five operability techniques at Continuous Lifecycle last year. So there's, there's, a, there's a video and slides 
uh, that expand on this middle section quite a bit more. So have a look. If you want more detail on, the, on, on this, this middle section, have a look on, online on, on the continuous lifecycle site and you'll, you'll find more stuff. But I just wanted to call these out. And modern kind of event-based logging, um, th th there's some tools and, 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 and uh, services we need to use. We need to have a, a log aggregation system that brings all logs in from multiple machines. We should probably be, be using um, uh, structured logging these days. So it's probably you know, logs are in JSON, they're all tagged and all that stuff. That's all fine, that's the mechanics. The intent at a human systems level of what I call modern logging is important as well. And that is the way in which we communicate with other teams about what we are going to log acts as an important part of design. So remember these ops people or the, the live services team or, or the, the, the um, IT ops people, whatever you call them, who have to run these systems, we make sure there's collaboration between the application development teams and the people running the systems on what, so we ask these people, what do you want to see in the logs? What alerts do you expect to see? What's interesting <coughs> from your point of view? What are the interesting events that happen in the software that we actually care about and that we actually need to raise as, as, as a log event? Because if these people, these poor people here in IT ops or, or support, if they're in a position where they just have pages and pages and pages, millions and millions and millions of events in the logs that are effectively meaningless, it's impossible for them to do their jobs. Their operator experience at that point is terrible. So we focus on the operator experience and say, what kind of things are important? We'll only log those things. Or we'll log them in a way which allows us to search for things and filter things effectively. So in this particular context here, uh, this is, let's say, it's an e-commerce shopping application, something like this. So we've got a basket, and we've got a basket item added, basket item removed. And we're using, um, we're using, uh, what's the word? Uh, enums. My mind went blank. We're using enums here, so in Java or .NET or the equivalents in things like Python and so on, to make sure that we've got unique human-readable uh, identifiers for interesting events. And if it's not interesting to the people who are going to run the system, then, we, then why are we logging it? Certainly, why, why, why are we logging it at a, a, like an info or warning or error level so that they, they can see it? Should, shouldn't, it shouldn't be getting down. It shouldn't be, those people who are running the system shouldn't be seeing non-interesting events. So logging is not just no longer about spewing stuff out that might be useful. Logging is part of the design of operability of the system we have to make sure that the experience of the people running the system is, is first class to enable them to do their jobs. So collaboration on the nature and, and exact details of what we log becomes a really important kind of DevOps interaction between these two teams. And actually, so in this specific case um, where I was working, uh, due to some poor choices uh, from some of the teams who had deployed some software just before I started, the IT ops people actually believed at that point that the Elk stack, so that's uh, Elastic Stack, uh, Logstash, and whatnot, that they believed that the Elk stack was absolutely terrible and they never wanted to see it again. Which is slightly strange. I thought, well, why, why is that? And it was exactly because of that reason. We had millions and millions and millions of logs that it was impossible for them to actually uh, do their job properly to, to respond to problems with the software. So we went through, we kind of rethought all of this stuff around logging and we found um, like a nice sized service, fairly small service to, to, to use this new approach on. And we worked from the start with the IT ops people, live services people and said, this will be your experience with this, with this new way of logging using Elk, don't worry, happens to use Elk, but here's what your experience will be. Work with us, believe, just, just have some belief in us, come along with us for a little while, and we'll show you that it will be better. And when that's, that, that particular service was finally deployed, they stood up by themselves at one of the uh, engineering guild or tech talk sessions and said, this is awesome, this is exactly what we want. Everyone else, please go ahead and implement this. So they changed from hating the logging, logging solution to absolutely loving it. It's the same technology. The intent 
and the way in which the collaboration happened was different. So the second technique is uh, this one here, so run book dialogue sheets. Uh, this is an A1 size sheet which you put on a table and you get the team around the room, or possibly two teams. You might get a team of application developers and a team of kind of infrastructure platform people. And uh, you lock them in the room until they filled in all the sheet. I'm just kind of joking, right? You don't actually lock the door. But what's on the sheet is a whole load of uh, criteria for uh, operability, effectively. Things that you will definitely need, or someone will need to deal with, if this system's going to work well. None of it is magic, right? There's all, all things that we're very familiar with. What's the service level? Who's the service owner? Um, how's it going to fail over? Um, what happens about patching? All, all really standard stuff that lots of people of inf infrastructure ops people have known for a long time. The, the magic here is that it's on a team size sheet. Put people in the room, everyone with a Sharpie or a marker pen, and they can fill in little bits of information. If they don't know the answer, if you don't know who the service owner is, put a question mark. Identify, like Tanya said yesterday, write it down. Be very, very explicit about where your, about your decisions and about where you have gaps in the knowledge. And so this is a vehicle for very good conversations about how the system is going to operate. If you've got gaps here, something might not work when you deploy to production. We actually have some of these, uh, cause we're, because we're sponsoring uh, the conference this, this, uh, this year, we actually have on our, on our, our sponsor table some of these sheets. Uh, so if you're interested, come along and grab one of these sheets and take it with you. I can see there's one or two people in the room who've already taken them. That's great. Um, and all of this stuff is Creative Commons uh, open source. The GitHub repos got yesterday 168 forks. So there's at least 168 people who found it kind of useful and have, have taken it and evolved it internally for them. Uh, so, you know, send us a pull request if we're missing something on, on one, of the, one of the headings, one of the criteria for um, operational concerns. Send us a pull request and we'll, we'll add it. This is fairly standard now. So each running, the, the third tool I want to show, the third technique I want to show is make, make sure that each endpoint, each thing that's running has got uh, an HTTP based uh, health check endpoint. This is kind of built in at a kind of Kubernetes level, but if you're, if you're, not, ru you're not running that, um, just make sure that everything running has some sort of HTTP health check. Even if you've got something like a database which doesn't have that natively, just put a little helper service in front of it. Because it means that we can build these kind of dashboards and report on the, on the health of an environment very, very quickly. Literally, you can get uh, a little dashboard app off GitHub, git clone, edit the config file, point it to an environment within literally four minutes is the quickest time that I've done it, if you have HTTP-based status uh, endpoints running for each thing, each kind of runnable thing that, that, that you've got running in your environment. There's a very, very powerful, and lo lots, of lots of kind of monitoring applications sort of support that implicitly or um, as a default. So it's a really useful thing to, really useful thing to make sure you bake in. If you do it from the beginning, very straightforward. Even retrofitting it is, is not particularly hard. Each service or component or runnable thing decides on its own health and reports that, yes, I'm healthy. No, I'm not healthy. The fourth um, practical technique is uh, to use correlation IDs. So in the particular place I talked about uh, last year, this was, already, this was already happening. This was already in place. Um, apart from the fact that in one or two um, in one or two cases, a different identifier was used as the correlation identifier. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. So in, if, we, if you are shipping a parcel, this is from a, par a parcel shipping uh, service. So this is like a web page on a parcel shipping company. You're sending a parcel and you want to track it. So you've got the tracking identifier and it's gone through various different states. It's been collected from the source. It's now been shipped through various delivery centers. And now it's, it's arrived at the destination. And the thing that ties all that together is this uh, tracking ID. So this is the equivalent of what we need to do in our software, where when a new request comes in, we assign it what we call a correlation ID or, or a tracking ID. And then at every hop through the system, we make sure we log that 
uh, and pass it downstream to the next, next component. And that allows us to, to reassemble the request um, and see all the machines or nodes, containers that that request has gone through. So it's fairly standard these days, but if, if that's something you're not doing, go and investigate this because it's incredibly useful as a diagnostic technique. Another reason why it's important from, a, from a, uh, an operability point of view is it helps to facilitate interesting conversations between different teams. You have to agree on uh, an identifier that, is stand that represents this is the correlation ID. So you have to choose that and make sure you're using the same identifier in, you know, when you're logging and in different parts, different services, different parts of the system. If you use this technique well, you can use it to generate useful conversations between different teams on how, how services uh, written by different teams are going to present the information that, that you end up being able to see here. You're having to align that. Um, having to align that kind of diagnostic capability between different teams. And the final technique is, is this one, is you taking, uh, taking some of the learning from user experience, so UX, and applying this internally to people who are not the primary users of the software, but are people like live services or IT support or um, ops or what you call them, maybe SRE, and doing a lightweight user persona for these, for these people. Um, the, the, the really key aspects of the, that we're trying to get by using a lightweight user persona are these three things here. So the motivations of those people, <coughs> what's, what's driving them, the goals, what are they trying to achieve, and their frustrations what things really annoy them about, uh, about the soft how the software works now or how the software has worked in the past. And so we can get UX experts to help us in this, characterize the needs of IT ops people, SREs, uh, live services people, to help drive the right kind of operational features in the applications that we're building in, in, the, in the product teams. So that the experience, the, the operator experience of these people is being met early on. And that will be, if you can have it, if you can arrange things so that the, these people working in IT ops, SRE, live services, if these people can be champions for your uh, way of building software, that's an incredibly powerful driver to make things work well. So these are the five things, just to run, just to summarize this mini, this little section, the, the filling in the middle of the cookies. So make sure you're using modern event-based logging, crucially not just focusing on the tools, focus on the intent, the collaboration between different teams when using that event-based logging. That's where the power lies. Try these run book dialogue sheet techniques or something similar. Get people around the table, get a whole a list of stuff that you know is going to have to be addressed to make the systems work well, to, make them, uh, to give them good operability. Uh, make sure you've got endpoint health checks. HTTP end endpoint health checks is, is really the, the, probably the best way. Make sure you're using correlation IDs, align different teams to make sure that you can trace a call through different parts of the system. And um, a focus on the operator experience using UX techniques, in this specific case, kind of lightweight user personas. These techniques and more are in this book here, this little sales pitch. They're, they're, they're in this book here, which, uh, which uh, I'm the co-author of this book. And um, we've got this on sale during Continuous Lifecycle with 30% discount. So come to this stand if you're interested in taking advantage of that. And, um, and you, you'll find a, a lot more details. We've got case studies in there. We've got um, other kind of te techniques and things for, for operability in there. So how, kind of, how does this stuff work at scale? So 700 or more people, 70 teams across lots of different locations. How, how can we kind of assess this and help, to, help teams to improve? So we did some work around uh, cross-team engineering standards. Now some of you 
And I go, whoa, I don't want to go anywhere near engineering standards. It's really scary. Or some, some architect has written them, and they're three years out of date, and they're all irrelevant. I'm not interested. So that's a really important point. Um, and it took us a little while to kind of work out a dynamic that, um, that was going to not be out of, mean that the, the, the standards were not going to be out of date straight away. So what we ended up coming up with was something like this, where we had a very small number of things that were mandatory. For example, the name of the correlation ID field when logging, that's mandatory. There's no value in having divergence on that because we need to be able to trace across multiple services. You will use exactly this field to represent that thing. Um, you will use, uh, let's say, uh, GitHub for source control. There's no value in someone picking something else. But a very, very small number of things in the, in the, in the inner, the kind of the very center of the, of the onion. Um, things that are unlikely to go out of date and have, that have high value in, in, in being uh, mandated. The next layer was this expected. Expected. We expect you to use uh, your Java or we, Java, whatever it was there. Java, I can't remember if it was on 8 or whatever. Anyway, Java, this version of Java, we expect you to use um, this log shipping component. We expect you to use something else. But it's not mandated. So if you use something else and can then demonstrate a really effective outcome from using that, great. Come and, come and share your experience at uh, one of the lunchtime sessions. And that gives us an interesting insight into, well, maybe you actually that's worth exploring. Or actually, someone might present it and, and other people say, actually, no, we've solved those problems before. You're, you're going to head down an awkward path. Go and have a look at this previous talk that we've done and some slides there and some details. We really recommend you don't do that. So the expected, the expected group is kind of a happy path, tried and tested, and there's quite, quite a large number of things in there. It helps teams get on board very quickly, and they'll get lots of support. But if they're, if they're very confident that they can do something differently, that's fine. There's a lot of recommended stuff here, which are kind of patterns that seem to work well. We recommend you use this, but actually it's equally valid to probably to use something else over here. So this sets up an interesting dynamic where the number of mandatory things is, is to, to get into the mandatory bit, something it has to be super high value. And it means that, that we're explaining the intent. Why is that thing mandatory? Oh, it's, I can see the reason for that. That's fine. I'm happy to, to go with that as a mandatory thing. And he set up an interesting dynamic within the, the as I said, 70-odd engineering teams, lots of different suppliers, that, that helped to get more buy-in for aligning teams across multiple different places, multiple different suppliers, multiple different streams of work. So if, if you're operating at a similar kind of scale, it's worth thinking about something like this. Um, again, it's the intent behind it. It's the kind of conversations that this thing is driving. So combined with the weekly uh, engineering guild and working group, where we could discuss what goes in mandatory, what goes in uh, expected and recommended, it set, up, it set up a great dynamic for kind of learning and, and, and learning from different people, learning from different teams. And it's emphasizing this kind of team engagement, basically. And then we did a kind of multi-dimensional engineering assessment. It wasn't quite as psychedelic as this. <coughs> the dimensions we used for the assessments across all these teams was uh, team health, uh, deployment, continuous delivery, flow, operability, and testing. Um, and it's taken from... Uh, we've pulled together the, the framework for doing this. If you go to softwaredeliveryassessment.com, it'll redirect you to a GitHub repository where all of this stuff is, is available to see. And the criteria for these six dimensions are taken from existing sources. Uh, so the team health check bit was taken from the Spotify health check, which is already, I think, open source or Creative Commons. Um, the book by uh, Mirko Herring, DevOps for the Modern Enterprise. The continuous delivery book I mentioned before. Uh, the book Accelerate by Nicole Forsgren and colleagues that was published last year. And then the uh, software operability book that you've already seen. 
and its companion in the series called Team Guide to Software Operability. So these, the, the criteria we've got for the assessment is all taken from books that are already published, already kind of well known and sort of proven, if you like. So we weren't inventing anything from scratch. Uh, there's a few more resources there which might be interesting. So um, operability questions, testability questions, and then cdchecklist.info, other ways of kind of uh, sharing some of these assessment criteria in, uh, to, to people who can't, maybe wouldn't understand how to read a GitHub repository, for example. Um, so, has any, raise your hand, if, has anyone used the Spotify team health check? <coughs> One, two, what, do you find it useful? Yeah, it's good, it's very really useful. Every, every team that I've worked with has found that this, the Spotify health check model very, very useful. <coughs> Um, so, how, broadly how it works is, uh, so what we've done effectively is taken the Spotify health check model, which is on a single dimension of, of team health, and we've added five more dimensions to have six dimensions in total. But we've taken the kind of, the way in which Spotify recommend running it, we, we've used that as a model, basically, partly because it's, it works, but also partly lots of, say, scrum masters or other people have already, have already used it. So it's a team self-assessment. The team self-assesses based on the criteria comes up with a score for itself. Um, we'll, we'll see the results of that in a second. The sessions are, take about two hours to go across these six different dimensions. So it feels a bit like a kind of extended retrospective, or maybe it's not extended for you, depending on how long your retro has left. Um, and so you typically had someone facilitating it, acting kind of like someone who would facilitate a retrospective um, to keep things moving along. Inside each um, assessment session, there was another facilitator in training. So that allowed us effectively to make the assessment kind of viral because that the person who was being trained in the assessment would then go on and do two more assessments and also train two more people. So then that was the way we kind of scaled it across multiple teams. Here's a, we, we recorded the, the results on big sheets, printed out big, big kind of A1 sheets, put it on the wall. So here's one of the dimensions for one team. Um, so this was operability. So how th th there, there are some additional uh, details for each of these headings here. So additional details you'll find on the website that I mentioned, uh, the criteria. Um, the sheet here just, just lists the, the kind of headings. But the team was able to rate itself on how well it collaborates on operability, for example. They're able to rate itself, in this case, on how much time and effort they spend thinking about and implementing operability within their team. In this particular case, they gave themselves kind of middling three out of five for that one, that's fine. Um, what else have we got? Um, how well they deal with failure modes in their software or their service. Again, this particular team thought, well, we're doing all right, we're about to three. You can see there's a lot of interesting kind of stuff, testability. Uh, certificates, uh, KPIs, logging, all sorts of stuff like this. There's more detail that you can see here, but the team was able to self-assess itself um, on these six dimensions, and then we brought the, the results together. And this allowed us across multiple teams to spot where it, were there any consistent problems. If a team rated itself really poorly on one of these areas, what could we, as the kind of engineer, core engineering group, do about it? Is there something that is missing, some documentation that's missing? Is it too hard to use this particular infrastructure service? And so on. So we use this as, these as signals to help work out where to invest kind of time in the platform, but also where to invest time for maybe assisting other teams just to raise their game a bit. And this is typically the response we got from every session that we ran. Can you see that at the back? So there's two, two, two stickies. One says value and one says execution. So basically, how much value did you get out of the session? How well was it executed? And pretty much, pretty much all of the sessions came out with, with, with all smiley faces. The teams really valued this self assess this opportunity to reflect, self-assess on these kind of different, different criteria. So as I mentioned, it's uh, Creative Commons uh, share alike. It's open source. If you're interested in having a look, just go to softwaredeliveryassessment.com and you'll, you'll, find, you'll find all the details. And obviously, as before, send us a pull request if you think something should be changed or there's, there's, there's something missing. Uh, 
So what are the results uh, so far? So I, I'm, I'm no longer on that, on that particular piece of work. I, for various reasons, had to, partly because I'm writing a book, which I'll mention in a minute, I had to finish at the end of, end of last year. But so far, uh, we went from two successful release candidate builds per week through, we increased the speed of that through to seven or eight of those successful builds per day. So that's pretty good. More than order, order of magnitude change. And then starting to see multiple independent routes to, uh, to production, to live. In terms of operability, the ops teams, they're, they're called live service teams there, uh, uh, really love the, the, the new operator experience that we've been able to show them, particularly on the logging side, uh, with some changes to how the dashboards work as well. And th there was no major operational problems. We managed to get people to see that things like logging and correlation IDs and things were actually an opportunity to improve collaboration between teams. And I think that was a real revelation for, for lots of people. And it's good to hear from, from people I know who are still working there that the, the weekly tech talks and kind of guilds and so on are continuing to kind of drive this awareness of, of, of good practice. Loads of other people involved, right? It wasn't just me, it wasn't just my colleagues in, in Axiologic, lots of other people as well. All right, some key takeaways then. Address operability early on. It's what some people call shift left, but I, I always find that a bit, uh, bit confusing. Address these operational aspects early on. We need to add checks into the deployment pipeline. Um, techniques that are very team focused, team first, like the Runbook dialogue sheet that you saw, you'll find that at runbook, runbook template.info. Um, but similar techniques that, that kind of get the team thinking about how effective their software is going to be when it runs in production. Absolutely foundational to have good logging in place. Use this well-defined event space. You can lean on your enums if you've got them in your language. Um, being able to read an event ID as a human being and immediately understand it. So as, a prog as someone writing the software, yes, you might understand what 3475 is as an event identifier. Does the person in ops or live service immediately know, know that? If they can see it says item added to basket, so much richer and more meaningful, cutting straight to the, the, the nature of the, of the problem. And we need to kind of make space for learning and sharing. It got to invest in this time, like Tanya was saying yesterday. Got to invest in opportunities for people learning in different contexts and sharing, sharing knowledge and practice. Um, something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is the concept of a thinnest viable platform. What is the smallest, thinnest platform that you can provide or that could be provided to enable application delivery teams to be to deliver rapidly and safely in your in your context. If the only platform you need is a web page that says we use these five Amazon or AWS services and we use this authentication mechanism. If that's all you need in your organization, that is your platform. It's a wiki page that sits on top of AWS. You don't need it to build anything more and that's awesome because you've saved a lot of time. Now, in your context, it's probably a bit more than that. But defining very, very clearly what that platform is and making sure that people have to use it have a good experience when they use it. For me, that's, that's a major takeaway from, from recent work that I've been doing. So, summarize this little closing section. Address operability early on. Make sure that you've got exceptional logging in place. Make space for learning and sharing. Make sure you've defined what your platform is from the point of view of people who have to consume it. And involve teams in, these, in improvements, like, like these assessments that we've seen. Get them bought into the improvements you're trying to make. There's a link to the operability book. If you're interested, again, we've got a 30% discount today. And there's a few more links as, as well in here so that you can find all this stuff when you download the slides later. In the slightly separate note, this is a book I've been working on, which is why I'm not working on anymore. If you're interested in the relationship between teams and technologies, platforms, how different teams interrelate, 
This book is coming out in September. It's published by IT Revolution Press, who publish Accelerate, DevOps Handbook, um, Phoenix Project, and so on. Um, we've got some really amazing case studies from great organizations around the world. Uh, so if you're interested, sign up uh, for the like, newsletter. You can actually buy it, pre-order it on Amazon, I think, now. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, head to uh, teamtopologies.com or come and find me at the conflict stand later on. And that's all I got, so thank you very much.